Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Aurora Ogden. I'm Director of Art at the Arts Club, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you this evening to what promises to be a fascinating discussion. We are joined by Darren Caulfield, Michael Woods, and Michael Clark. And the conversation this evening will centre around Tales from the Colony Room. And now, uh, Darren is the author of Tales from the Colony Room, Soho's Lost Bohemia, so he will be guiding our discussion. I urge you very much to uh, make it down to Della's Foster Gallery to see the fabulous exhibition that's on now until the 20th of December, which has uh, been inspired by, by Darren's book, of course. So make sure that you do, well, actually there's a lockdown happening, but if it ends on the 2nd of December, then I urge you to get down between the 2nd and the 20th um, and uh, it won't disappoint. But Darren, it's a real pleasure to welcome you and the two Michaels and I hand over to you. Thank you. Um, I would like to take you back to the beginning of the whole story about the Colony Room Club. It's a very interesting thing that we're talking about a time of post-war London. We're talking about a time where London is coming out of the bombing of the Second World War and the drinking laws and the whole area is quite different from as we know it now. The area that the Arts Club is based in and also the surrounding environs of Soho and Mayfair were known as the Square Mile of Vice. This area was the, considered the most sort of um, illegal area in the whole of Europe for prostitution, for crime, for all sorts of things. When we look at this area now, we think of it as a sort of wonderfully creative, spontaneous area. Well, it was at that time too, but it did have a very bad reputation. In fact, it was completely notorious. It was only um, eventually outstripped by the Reaper Barn in Germany uh, about the time the Beatles went there in the 60s for being such a notable area for vice and all kinds of social problems and illegality. After the Second World War, you couldn't uh, drink of an afternoon, you couldn't do certain things. London was very grim, it was very grey, it was much colour. There wasn't very much to do. So people generally just tended to hang around bars, but um, in pubs and places to keep warm, you know, even to keep a house uh, heated, it was very expensive. So a lot of bars and clubs became people's front rooms. The drinking laws were very different then. Um, so if you could go to a, a bar or a pub would open at 11 a.m. in the morning and it would close at 2.30 in the afternoon, it wouldn't be open again until 5.30 in the evening. To plug this gap in drinking hours, uh, there was a whole series of afternoon drinking clubs, which no longer exist. They were kind of extinct species. The drinking clubs really came about for people who wanted to drink between the hours of 2.30 in the afternoon and 5.30 in the evening. These generally tend to be creative people or people who worked in industries such as journalism, literary things, etc., etc. So in Westminster alone, the, uh, the borough of Westminster, there was 500 afternoon drinking clubs. Now there are none at all. So there was drinking clubs for every kind of uh, type of profession of people you can imagine. There was private drinking clubs for taxi drivers. There was private drinking clubs for jazz musicians. There was private drinking clubs for villains, private drinking clubs for policemen. All these people drinking outside of the license hours of the law. But the most notorious of all the 500 drinking clubs and the most famous was Muriel Belcher's Colony Room Club, which could be found at 41A Dean Street, Soho. What made this club so exceptional? wasn't its interior, wasn't even its location. It was actually the woman who ran it, a woman called Muriel Belcher. Muriel Belcher was an incredible person. She was Jewish, she grew up in Birmingham. Her parents, for at one point, won the Adelphi Theatre, but her dad became a, a loan shark, let's say. And the family always had money problems. She also grew up in a very strict Jewish background. And at some point, you have to remember about all these people in the post-war era, they didn't really want to tell their stories of themselves. They came to London, they escaped to Soho, because in Soho, you could be who you wanted to be. Because of the repression of English society after the war, if you were gay, as Muriel was, she was a lesbian, but if you were anybody growing up in the regions and you felt you were slightly different from your family or your background, people escaped to Soho. Soho was a beacon of counterculture and they came to it like moths to a flame. Muriel's character, well, what was Muriel Belcher like? Well, what can we say about her? What we do know is that she was an exceptional woman. 
Uh, the day before the club opened, a man was taken across the road by a poet called um, Brian Howard from the Gargoyle Club. And the day before the club actually opened, the man who came over the road, he was a very young painter then, who wasn't very well known, called Francis Bacon. Somehow she saw something in this remarkable young man. She couldn't quite put a finger on it, but she knew that he was going to be an incredibly important person. So she immediately hired him for £10 a week to bring in people. It wasn't a job. She called him a hostess. It was a kind of a funny catch-all term for what she wanted him to do. But she said, you can drink here freely and do whatever you like, but please just bring in your friends. So one thing we could say about Mew is that she had an incredible antennae for talent. She knew nothing about painting and knew nothing about literature, but her tiny little club became the in place, the most important place in London, where all the confluences of talent that would then make post-war London famous uh, converged together. So in this tiny little club, which is about, I'd say about 14 meters long, maybe 15 meters long maximum, but somehow it managed to in, in capture the whole, whole art scene. Of course, you didn't have to be an artist to drink there. There was also stagehands who drank there, people who work in theatres, pornographers, the occasional uh, lady of real repute who walked the streets. It was a real mixed bag, but the club was tiny. Unlike clubs nowadays, you have a receptionist or uh, someone on the door to stop you from coming in because you're not a member. The colony rooms was quite accessible. Now, to find the colony rooms wasn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. The colony rooms was in a, a small dark doorway that led off the street between two restaurants. And so did all the other brothels in the area. So unless you knew the exact address where you're going to, it was a very anonymous place. And I felt myself many years later walking into the club that he was actually doing something quite sort of um, illegal in a way. That people would look at you while you were dying off the street and disappearing up this dark doorway. But if you knew where it was, you'd walk up this very, very dark, dark Georgian staircase and I'd get onto a first floor landing in a Georgian house and push open an anonymous green door. And at this, till this point, it was very quiet. And like someone cooking a good meal or making a fantastic recipe, she occasionally dropped in the odd different ingredient. So for example, Michael Clark will tell you in a while how he came to the club and he did a very similar thing that many other people did, because they literally turned up, walked up the stairs and walked into the club and were looked at by the owner. See, because there wasn't a receptionist, Muriel sat by a stall next to the door, and the door made a very loud click when it swung open. But as soon as the door clicked, everybody in the club would look around, including Muriel, and they'd size you up. And they'd say, yes, can I help you, if you weren't a member? And people would sort of stand and say, you know, uh, I'd like to come in with you. Yes, well, members only, members only. You know, they'd look you up and down, and she'd see if you're worth coming in or not. So membership, paying money was necessarily what the club was really about. Mira had this very interesting thing about her, like most alcoholics do, people who drink too much, is that she could never always remember people's names. And one of the great funny things about the club was that it made up nicknames for people. Everybody had a nickname and it was perfectly easy to drink there for decades, like I did, not knowing people's real names or professions. To talk about your job, to network as we do it in a modern club, was considered boring. The biggest crime in the colony rooms was to be a bore. People went there to entertain each other, to get away from their jobs. Francis Bacon went there and he never spoke about art. He wasn't interested in really talking about art. He went there to get away from the solitary uh, life of being an artist in a studio. So did Freud. So you have this amazing place full of people with nicknames such as Daughter, which was the name Francis, she gave to Francis Bacon, and Francis Bacon called Muriel Mother because to him she was his surrogate mother. But also we had people who were known sometimes by their odd professions. We had Brian the Burglar, we had Covent Garden Mick who was the master carpenter of the Royal Opera House, we had one woman who was known as Miss Hitler because she was so bossy, and another one was known as Butterlegs because they spread so easily. So there was this kind of camaraderie between names and jocular witticisms that ran through the club. Of course, Bacon was the most famous member and Bacon drank there for over four decades. Despite becoming famous, the colony rooms were somehow always his home. Wherever he went in the world, wherever he did, he always came back to the colony. There's many stories about Francis and of course the people who gravitated around Francis, the artists that he met and who admired him and who loved him so much, but then coined uh, a label, they were called the School of London. That was coined by an artist called R.B. Uh, Kittai, 
the American artist and also a great artist himself. But it's an awkward kind of term, really, because there is no School of London. If anything, they're the kind of friends of Francis Bacon. They're all part of a loose group of artists that hung out together, but all became incredibly important artists. What's interesting also about this time is that American art predominated. Abstract expressionism. Everybody thought the figuration was dead, that there was no point to figure of art at all. But in Muriel's salon, she cultivated figure of artists. She cultivated the people that were going to come on and become some of the most important artists of the late 20th century. There you could find Lucian Freud, a young man looking around the bar, a bit of a sexual predator in a way, always on the lookout for beautiful young women or anyone who took his interest really. And there'd be Francis holding court and pouring champagne. We've all heard the anecdotes. There's many in the book. But of course, Francis, one of the great joys about being in the club is when Francis would turn up. There was one afternoon, as we talk about in the book, which is full, absolutely full of these sort of interesting anecdotes and shows you the other side of the or academic books that are written about these people in the club. There's the one afternoon Francis came into the club and he always pulled his collar when he was annoyed. And he came dash, slamming through the door of the club. And Ian Board was sitting there and said, Francis, Francis, what's wrong? He said, Harrods, I'm never going there again. And he said, but Francis, why? He said, well, they've had an exclusive evening. They invited all their best clientele. So I went there and I bought so many shirts and so many jackets and so many suits. When I got home, I decided I didn't like any of them. So I threw them all in the dustbin. Now, the club being the club and being so tiny, upon hearing that, most of the members downed their drinks so fast and decided to side to through the door and emptied out. And Ian Board said he'd never seen the club empty so quickly. And the next week, everybody was back up the club wearing all the clothes and all the wonderful things that Francis had bought for himself from Harrods. Francis was a great character and he had a, a complete disregard for art, unlike many artists nowadays. He thought that, you know, art was very important, but also life was important. And if he saw something he didn't like, he wasn't scared to call it out for being what it was. One day, an artist came to the club and decided to try and ingratiate themselves with the owner and left a watercolour behind the bar. Francis turned up an hour or so later when the artist was still there, a very young artist who just graduated from St. Martin's School of Art. And after all the his champagne and pouring it and the ritual of handing it around the club and Francis being so generous, Francis's uh, gaze was caught by this watercolour, which he thought was absolutely dreadful. And Francis being Francis, wasn't going to ingratiate himself. When he saw bad art, he saw bad art. So he ordered a bottle of champagne and uh, shook up the bottle and sprayed it over the watercolour, which then dissolved in the entire room, much to the hilarity of everyone around him and much to the dis upset of the artist who was there. Francis was a great character. He understood that the club was a salon. And so he'd been in uh, France in the 1940s, 1930s, and he'd seen Gertrude Stein's salon. Gertrude Stein, of course, was a, an amazing writer, but also a great woman in terms of meeting people and cultivating them. Her salon in Paris included people like Picasso, Giacometti, Ernest Hemingway, Cecil Beaton, etc. And when Francis Bacon was being Mule's hostess for £10 a week, he brought in people, he cultivated them. So he brought in Nina Hamnet, Isabel Wallstorm, at one point, he brought in Giacometti, Henry Cartier-Bresson. There's a very funny story about Henry Cartier-Bresson when he was in the club, which Michael Clark can tell you about later. And it's very, very funny indeed. Of course, the club also attracted the great literary people of its time. Poets were very big then. We don't really think very much of poetry now, but at that time, poetry was very rock and roll. It was quite sexy. So Dylan Thomas drank there and famously threw up on the carpet. There was another poet there called Paul Potts, who was quite a regular person, who sort of traversed from being a very uh, great poet in a way with lots of potential into being a sort of mumbling sort of drunk that would defecate himself on the bonquettes after 20 or 30 years of staying in Soho too long. There's a terrible disease connected with Soho called Soitis, which is a, a euphemism for talent and uh, creativity that's been lost through the amount of alcohol that's drunk. And it's quite a, 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 a viable thing that one sees going on in one's own life. I mean, I've witnessed it with people myself. Of Stephen Spender, the great poet, Muriel, being as witty as she was, said, I don't know why they call her Spender. She never puts her hand in her pocket. Of course, 
the club reflected everything that happened in 60 years, not just the art, but also what happened in politics. Even though politics was never really discussed in the club, the two notorious uh, KGB double agents, Burgess and McLean, mm -hmm. drank in the club. So did Tom Dryberg, who was an MP, who run the William Hickey column for the Express. Dryberg was friends with uh, Burgess and McLean. He was a notorious uh, homosexual, and homosexuality was illegal. And when he was the uh, chairman of the Labour Party, driving up north with the then Prime Minister, Jim Callaghan, they decided they needed to stop off somewhere to uh, relieve themselves. Standing behind a hedge with Jim Callaghan, Tom, always on the lookout for someone, had turned around to the Prime Minister of England and said, oh, my dear Mr Callaghan, what a wonderful piece you have. The jokes and the funniness of the club are what the book is about. The book is an oral biography. Many books have been written about Soho, but they don't ever write about it or about the artists in terms of how they saw things. It's always written from the point of view of an academic. I realised this was a fault with many books and also many programmes and many shows that are made about this period in art. So I set about creating a book that actually is full of interviews, interviews with Bacon, where he explains what it was like to come to the club the day before it opened. Found and lost interviews with Muriel Bell to explain what it was like to meet Francis. And somehow by putting all these interviews together and interviewing more people who are still with us, who are still alive, I created a book which tells the story of the club, tells six decades of the underbelly of British art scene and society from the point of view of the people who drank there. Because it seemed to me important to hear their voices. So in the book, you don't have one opinion of an event. You have multiple opinions of different events and different things that happen in the art world because life is like that. We all have an opinion. Of course, the club also attracted villains. Mira wasn't very big on villains. When the Cray twins came in, she told them where to get off and they never came back again asking for protection money. Someone else got a bit too insistent one day and they were found two weeks later hanging from a rope outside the French house, dead. What's interesting about the club is in its 60 year history, there was more romances, more deaths, more horrors, and even more sex scandals on those premises than anywhere else. And if they didn't happen there, they were definitely planned there. I remember one afternoon sitting in a club at three o'clock as a young art student, and a journalist turned up and said that the then Prime Minister, John Major, had been having an affair. It wasn't the fact that politicians have an affair that seemed so interesting. It was just that such a dull, uninteresting man like John Major could be found sexually attractive. What the problem was, as with all these kind of things, is that he got some of the names wrong in the affair. The club was great. It kept abreast of all the sex scandals. But in this case, he named John Major's caterer as the person he was having an affair with. So John Major was the first MP, I think Prime Minister actually, to successfully sue for libel he ruined that journalist's career on the pretext that he wasn't having an affair. That journalist went to death, went to uh, died, uh, always assuming that John Major was a liar. Then it turned out 10 years after this journalist died that John Major had been having an affair all the time, but it was with Edwina Curry. So he got the name of the person wrong, but he hadn't got the fact wrong that John Major was actually committing adultery. So stories about Soho and drinking clubs tend to get mixed up. But you did meet the most amazing people there. I remember spending one afternoon sitting down and chatting to a man for an hour and a half. And then it turned out at the end that he was Myra Henley's psychiatrist, one of the most notorious child killers in England at the time. As I said before, the greatest crime in the club was to be a bore. It didn't matter how much money you had. If you were boring someone, Mira would throw you out. She'd say, you're being a bore. Get out. I don't do bores, but they said, but me, I'm a member. She said, I don't care, you're boring people. You must leave. I'm sorry, it's a mistake I made. What's interesting also about is how British culture has changed over the years in the art world. At one time, drink was very prolific. Now, no one really drinks anymore. If somebody was to turn up drunk to an art opening, like Francis Bacon or some of the other people, they would actually, it would be the end of their career. To be seen, to drink, to enjoy yourself, to live on the edge is no longer a thing to do. Artists have to be investable. You have to be an investment. And no one wants to invest in someone who's committing a form of existential suicide. But most great art does seem to happen this way. 
What's uh, interesting about the book is the trajectory of it towards the end, through the final decades, is it shows you the death of Bohemia. Not only the death of Bohemia itself, but also the death of drinking culture. Society changes. People aren't having expense accounts anymore. There was a time when a journalist or author was given these huge expense accounts where they were allowed to go out and entertain people. Now, if you try and tell the tax man on your tax return that all these expensive uh, lunches and things are uh, actually part of your business to go and meet people, they won't allow them to take them off your uh, tax bill. So the entire culture of everything we've done and how we intermeet each other has changed. After, during the 1980s, the club went for a fallow period. In 1988, the drinking laws changed where pubs could open all day and all the remaining private afternoon drinking clubs closed down except for the colony rooms. Most of them tried to change their hours, the ones that did try and survive, open till one or two in the morning, but the colony rooms stuck to the same old rigid licensing laws from three o'clock in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night. As they said, you got the best out of them by 11, why well, don't send them out and let someone else deal with them? They've already had too much to drink. But what was interesting about the 90s was that the YBAs came along and it was revived. The club became the new in place to drink. So Damien Hurst, Tracy Evan, Sarah Lucas, who even worked behind the bar for a year, then became the new in people who drank in the club. And you could meet all the next movers and shakers of another generation. I remember one other day being served by General Craig behind the bar. But that's enough about my reminiscences of the colony rooms. I'd like to introduce you now to two other people who have the most incredible association with the club, but also have the most incredible stories to tell about how they made their art and why they made it. Very much so, yes. Um, I first went to the Colony Room Club 43 years ago this November. It was late November, a Tuesday evening, and I was on my way to the reading room at the British Museum. I wanted to go to the Colony Room Club because I'd read an article by Dan Farson and obviously I knew Mike Andrews' painting, which was uh, a photograph of his painting, The Colony Room Club, which was on his easel in a book um, called The Private View. And so I knew of the club in that way and of course through Francis and Francis' paintings of Muriel. I was walking along Dean Street and I'd always looked for the club but could never find it. And I was just walking along Dean Street because I knew I could get over to the British Museum that way. And I saw, as though it was in a neon light, Colony Room Club members only. And so I decided I would just simply walk in, which I did do. I walked up the stairs, opened the door, and the first person I saw was Francis. He was stood roughly at about quarter past from where I was in front of a mirror. He turned and looked at me. An elderly lady to my left greeted me as though I was a long lost friend and said, hello, dearie, how are you? And I said, I'm very well, thank you, and yourself. And we just talked. And Francis came over and said, can I buy you a drink, young man? I said, I'd like a gin and tonic. And the barman, who was Ian, came along and said, excuse me, are you a member? And I said, no, I'm not. And the lady to my left grabbed hold of my sleeve and started to tug on my sleeve. And she said, say yes, dearie, say yes. And I said, no, I'm not actually a member. And I didn't realize it was Ian at the time. And I didn't realize that that was Muriel. And he asked, Ian asked me a question. He said, is that do you recall the door that you came in by? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, would you kindly leave by it? So I did do. But as I was leaving against the green background, I saw one of those triptychs of Francis and I realized it must have been Muriel I was speaking to. So a week or so later, I went back and Ian was slightly less paranoid about Francis and Muriel being there. And he and I had quite a long conversation. He very kindly said he'd take me to see Muriel. I went round to see her in Shelton Street and we got on very well. And from that point onwards, I would visit her quite regularly and did a series of portraits of her. The main picture that I did of her was Muriel Belcheril in bed, which is behind me at the moment in the exhibition. And that won a prize at the Royal Academy, the Charles Wollaston Award. The frame 
is a chopped down bacon frame, which I think gave me some luck because the painting was sent to a couple of exhibitions. The first one it was refused from as it was the second one. And then it was accepted and I won a prize at the Royal Academy. There's a video that I made that is a sort of tribute in a way. In fact, the, the name of it, the title is um, Muriel Belcher. Um, with Daughter on Her Mind, a tribute to Muriel Belcher, which showed at the gallery for the first two weeks and was sponsored by Ice Rocks of London. And it contains a whole series of images that I've made of Muriel and it's a sort of homage to her. And I've been told that you can now see that. Um, it lasts for about three minutes, I think. And then I'll speak about the images after that has been shown. If we could have the images, if possible, please. Mm -hmm. 
these um, a series of images relating to that projection. I wanted to do a projection that in somehow put together a series of images relating to the people that I met at the colony room and specifically Muriel and Francis. The thing that Francis said was one of the main problems for a painter was that it's so difficult to find a subject. And after having met both Muriel and Francis, I found that I had a subject and that subject or both subjects have occupied me now for the past 43 years. The image on the left hand side of the screen is a pencil drawing I did of Francis. It started out actually as a study of a late Rembrandt self-portrait in the National Gallery and for some reason working from the centre outwards on the nose it it became to look like Francis and um, I just simply pursued that and it became that drawing. That drawing was bought by the British Museum and it was the first drawing of mine or first work of mine that entered a, um, a public collection. What I find interesting about drawing and painting is that it tends to reveal the occult. I think it's the artist's job to reveal the occult and in doing so inform the viewer. With this particular drawing there are certain things that Nick Rogue would say to me many years later just a, just a clue, just a little clue and the lower part of Francis's neck on this there's a slight indication something around there which was a choker which he used to wear. I never saw him not wearing that. I saw Francis and met Francis many times in the club in London, also in Rees Mews in his apartment and also in his studio, as well as seeing him from time to time in Paris. And the, the choker, I was told by Ian that he wore that because he was given it by a lover. And the choker, Gradually, as he got larger, the choker got tighter and it seemed to slowly asphyxiating him, which I thought was a very curious thing because there was a discussion that I had with Francis and Ian. Ian was quizzing Francis about cyanide because there was a discussion about if one were to get to a certain age and things stopped working, what would be the best way to end it? And Ian said, I believe cyanide. And so Francis said, yes, of course it is. But the problem with it is it's quite expensive. And I said to Francis that the interesting thing about cyanide, I thought was, I'd been told by a physician that it was called the carpet death. And even though it was fast, it was very painful. He listened intently and I, I passed on the information that I'd heard from a physician that the reason it was called the carpet death is that the victims of cyanide, when they used it as a form of suicide, was to lie in bed and take it. And it acted so quickly as they got up and tried to get to the window because cyanide worked in a way of starving the body of oxygen, that they would collapse between the bed and the window. And in a curious way, I've always linked that discussion to Francis's choker. His left ear is missing on this image also. And the reason for that, of course, is that whole notion of the wounded healer it relates very specifically to a time when Francis spoke to me in his studio about Van Gogh. And so I left the left ear out because it was the ear that Van Gogh took off. And we have that extraordinary image by Van Gogh in the Quarto collection. Francis showed me a, a letter that he'd received and it was a quote from one of the letters of Van Gogh and he said, lies if you like, but lies that are more truthful than the literal truth. And I think that's a very interesting thing, which I picked up on with another conversation that I had with Francis. If we could move on to the next slides, please. 
the left hand slide uh, a study for the portrait I did of Muriel, which was then used to make uh, a print which is called the Colony Room Suite, which is in the British Museum. If we could have the next slide, please. Thank you. This relates specifically to a piece that I made and I was given the opportunity to make through Ice Rocks London, which is a small portrait of Francis, which is made of 4,802 tiny diamonds. These black and white diamonds form an image like a constellation and is surrounded by the great bear. The reason I use the great bear in this was again because of that thing, as I go back to that letter that Francis talked about by Van Gogh, the lies if you like, but lies that are more literal than the literal truth. There's the painting where Van Gogh uses the great bear over all, which of course wouldn't have been in that position. So he's taken a liberty with that, shifted it round. It's a kind of cubist thing before cubism in a way or running concurrently with what Suzanne was doing. And I had a number of conversations with Francis, particularly about Suzanne. The image on the left-hand side from the Grand Palais interests me specifically because, of course, it relates very much to Michel Leris, who Francis talked to me a lot about, and I have great interest and respect for. This particular image, if we see on the right-hand side where the audience is for the bullfight, we see the vexillium, and I use that as the starting point for the image that I made of Francis, every man and every woman is a star. It's a double-sided piece and it's in the collection, one of the edition is in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in the Judith uh, Bollinger Gallery. The image is double-sided and it's meant to be kinetic, so it spins. And as it spins, the images of the great bear, which are part on one side and part on the other, start to flicker in the background and Francis's head through the persistence of vision becomes a three-dimensional object. If we could move on to the next slide, please. This is a portrait that was taken of a group of people, myself in the centre, underneath the portrait of Muriel, and on the right hand side, on the on the left hand side, Francis and Mike McKenzie. Um, Mike McKenzie was the resident pianist at the club, and Mike always used to play an introduction for people who were coming into the club who he particularly liked, and for Francis it would be Lush Life and Lush Life was by Billy Strayhorn, who released that in 1948 when the club opened. Mike would play, when I came into the club, the, the opening bars from all along the Watchtower. And I was interviewed once and someone said, well, why was that? And I simply said, there has to be some kind of way out of here. Thank you. Anyway, I was made a member and I gradually incorporated myself into the club and got to know people. And what I got to know about them was not who they were, not what they did, but I got to know them as people, the essence of them. And it's that that became interesting, not just making portraits, but the essence of who they were. And people like Peter Davis, Gavin Jones, the artist, sitting there one, afternoon in, the, in a beam of sunlight, reading the paper and then just chatting and laughing. And you got a feel for the club, the people in it, how it ran, what the kind of culture was. And the culture was this for me, I can't talk for anyone else, because I think the colony room is different for every single person. It's a unique experience. But for me, it was a, a kind of forcing house for my ideas and what would later become the kind of work that I would go on to do. Primarily working with Nicholas Rogue on many of his films. And I remember one day going in and Francis was standing there holding the collar of his leather coat and he said, oh dear boy, I had some champagne. So what have you been doing? And I said, well, I've just come back from the BBC. They signed me to work on two deaths. Nick Rogue film with Michael Gambon and Sonia Braga. But he said, excellent, excellent. 
Well, three or four weeks later, I went back into the club on a Friday and Francis said, so how's two deaths going? I said, well, we've not started yet, Francis. It takes a while, you know, production, which he didn't really want to hear. A year went on, still no two deaths. Three years went on. And Francis said, so I presume two deaths has died. And I learned. Don't say anything about what you're doing. Keep it quiet. Don't mention it until it's in the bag. So I learned how to be quiet in the comedy room club. I learned to talk to people about myself, not just my work, but about who I was and about who they were. And one person I got to meet was Jay Landersman. Now, everyone thought Jay was incredibly pretentious. Well, indeed, he was very pretentious. Um, you know, in his own kind of way. But I kind of liked his pretentiousness because that's who Jay was. That was the essence of Jay. And it wasn't a pretentiousness that was unfunny or unendearing for me. I found it very endearing, amusing. And Jay, unlike a lot of people in Soho who you got drunk with, who didn't kind of recognize you the next day or passed you by in the street, Jay always, always nurtured you, looked after you, bought you dinner, bought you a drink, and remembered you. And the photograph I did of Jay, uh, my first photograph of Jay, much later on became the book cover for, um, for Jay Walking, for Heinemann's. And of course, then I used to go in with George Melly, especially at Christmas when George was doing Ronnie Scott's, and um, he had a life contract. And Mike McKenzie would be at the piano, George would accompany him. And there were the kind of unique experiences that you couldn't get anywhere else in London or any other club. And I've been to Jerry's and I've been to a number of others, but they weren't like the comedy room. Everything somehow coalesced and worked. And when you left it, sometimes not even remembering you left it. One night I was brought home by Lady Margaret and I woke up in my bed the next day with a bucket by the bed and a and a little note saying, I undressed you, nothing happened between us, but there's a bucket by your bed and I hope you're okay. And so I learned that I couldn't really drink. I'm not a very good drunk. And so Michael Voges, kind of picking up on this after I've had a quiet word with him, used to put a shandy under the counter for me when I came in. And so I could drink along all evening with everyone else and go home completely sober. And that was our secret. Michael never said a word. So you can have secrets in the comedy group club. I think probably the best and the worst moment I had was Ian Ball said, look, Francis is coming in tomorrow. Whatever you do, Madam Photographer, don't ask to photograph him. And so Friday came and I was there. Francis came in and he introduced me. Oh, there you are, dear boy. How are you? I haven't seen you. And the first thing I said was, can I photograph you, Francis? And the whole room went quiet. People coughed, shuffled, silence descended. Ian Bull's nose grew more and more purple. It was like a big parrot on the stool, ready to jump off and peck. And Francis looked at me and then pirouetted out the door, slammed it, and then came pirouetting back like a ballerina and said, what's the point? It's all been done before. And then he ran out the door again, slammed it, and then came roaring back in and said, what can you add that hasn't been done before? And I just whispered, nothing. He said, well, there you go, have some champagne. Two weeks later, I was doing some work for Private Eye, I was photographing one of their functions, and I saw the comedy room light on, and I thought, well, I'll just go up and have a quick. And I had my camera and flash. And as I went in, Ian and Francis were standing by, by the bar. And Francis said, my dear boy, he said, there you are. He said, look, you've got your camera. He said, why not take a photograph of me and Ian? And I looked and I didn't know whether this was a trap. It could have been, it's the Conley Group Club. And I looked at Francis and I smiled and said, what's the point? It's all been done before. What can I add? Francis smiled and he said, quite right, quite right. Sit next to me. And then he said, Dear boy, do you masturbate? I said, well, sometimes. He said, when, when? I'm really pleased to hear that. So do I, but when? 
I said, well, sometimes when I feel tense or anxious or... And he put his hand down on my knee and he squeezed it really very, very hard. And he said, well, do you feel tense now? I went out that evening, got the cab home, sitting in the back of the cab. I thought about that little interlude with Francis. I thought to myself, do you know, Michael, one of the 20th century's greatest painters has just called you a wanker. <laughs> and in a way he kind of had. But then later, he bore no grudge, nor did I. And we talked about all sorts of things that interested him. My subject, neuroscience, clinical psychiatry, the nervous system. And I wouldn't say I was a great friend. I was an acquaintance in the common room. We were friends for the moment that we touched. And that was it with so many people in the comedy room. You did become great friends, but you were friends with people that you touched while you were there. Michael Clark, we did become kind of good friends. And in fact, I think that was me who introduced Michael to Nicholas Rogue and George May. But you know, but friendships were kind of within the club and what was in the club stayed within the club. And so you could be private in the club, you could be yourself and you could be judged, and you could be got at, you could be told off, you could have a row, but that was okay. It didn't matter, you could still go back the next day, and no one would bat an eyelid. I, mean, I used to do some work for James Birch and Paul Comran, and uh, I remember doing the uh, photographs for the Independent of Bruce Lacey. I'm afraid I've got a picture of him here, but Bruce has become a pagan. He was famous in the 60s. He was kind of mad kind of constructions and I think one called Mr. Pornography that she was in the Tate. And uh, I did all these photos of Bruce and his pagan paintings and pagan ritual and even accompanied to this life and death process on the bongo drums, which I couldn't play. But, you know, after the show, Bruce was stripped naked, blow his conch, run around uh, Soho Square, and back into the Condi Room Club, and much to the applause of everyone. But after that, after that, it was then on to the next. And so my photographs of people changed. They weren't the snapshots or portraits of people that I was trying to, like, catalogue all the famous people that I met. It didn't matter who I met. It didn't matter if they were famous or not. I didn't care. And I should mention here that it was Harry Diamond that I met much earlier, just before the Colony Room Club. And Harry and I, you know, who was a member of Photograph Francis and Lucid, Harry bought a camera in Brick Lane for a fiver, a Pentax Spotmatic. And for some reason, Harry's photos are quite extraordinary. When he photographed me, I commissioned him give him some money, he was always broke. He stood me up against the wall and he said, Mike, I'm gonna shoot you there. It felt like a summary execution. And indeed, he pulled out this massive Russian light meter, Jerry flexed me with it, and then said, what does it say? Because he couldn't read a light meter. And I told him, and then he stood back and he kind of focused and then he leapt in the air with an almighty scream and took my photograph. He did that for 36 frames. Each one, I felt myself kind of quivering and bearing up, oh my God, again. But when he showed me those photographs of me, the ones he'd taken, every single one was perfectly exposed, was perfectly sharp, and captured a rather depressed man standing there in the Golden Road. He captured something inside me. And it was that, and it's to that that I think I owe the Condi Room, to look beyond just the, what we call the photograph, to look deeper. What is it we're doing? Why am I taking photographs? What for? And now, these years on, I got a phone call from the National Portrait Gallery to go in, and because Harry, Harry's work was bequeathed to them. And I went through Harry's photographs, boxes upon boxes. And I came across a, a contact sheet of Harry as a very young man, when he used to be a stage man. And there was this extraordinary guy. 
But photography transformed Harry's life. It transformed it. It gave him a sense of purpose, a sense of creativity, a sense of connectivity. And I think the reason he was so good was because technically he was completely incompetent. He didn't see the camera as something technical. He saw it as an extension of himself. And that is what the colony room taught me, that the camera in my hands is just an instrument, an extension of who I am, that somehow glimpses who other people are. And for that, I'm ever grateful. It's always with me. Thank you. Darren, Michael, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much. Just some fantastic anecdotes there. It makes me really rather sad that this place is closed. I'm not sure if I would have been welcome there, but I gather it's the 10th anniversary uh, coming up. Is that right, Darren? Yes, it just passed. It was the 10th anniversary of the club closing in 2008. Oh my gosh, what a loss. Um, now we have a question here from a, let's see, a Chris Breen. It says, good evening. I thoroughly enjoyed your book. Thank you. Alabama 3, the band, got a name check. I believe that they played at Michael's funeral. Did you ever meet them? Do you have any anecdotes? Yes. I remember that the lead singer fell into the uh, basement of a pub where they had the doors open to let the beer barrels in. One night he fell all the way through into the basement and broke his neck. And then after a week in hospital, he got bored. So he came out and he was standing in the club with a neck brace on and a, a, a surgical gown and no shoes. He had escaped from hospital and was standing at the bar drinking the gym and tonic. Of course, on a tab because he didn't have any cash or credit cards on him. But it was that kind of place. Yes, I, did, I saw them there quite a lot. They were very good, actually. They're very nice people. But they started to really drink there when the Sopranos came out. They're, they'd gone from sort of, not obscurity, but... They're, one of their tracks was used for the TV series as a Sopranos, which is really big, and I suppose that's where they made lots of money from. But lovely men, very funny. I'm actually watching the Sopranos at the moment. It's so good. Um, well, so really, unfortunately, I think we have now run out of time, um, but it was absolutely fascinating to listen to the three of you. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'm told by Dallas Foster Gallery that although lockdown is starting this week, uh, we can arrange for a virtual tour via Zoom or Skype or FaceTime or however works best for, for anyone that would like to view the exhibition who hasn't been able to get there in person. So just drop us an email uh, to art at theartsclub.co.uk and we can arrange for that. But um, thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. Thoroughly, a uh, thoroughly fun way to spend a Monday. And uh, I urge you all to go and buy the book as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.